got our technical difficulties out of the way. It's good to, good to see you. How have you been? I've been pretty good. Pretty good. Um, before we get going in the podcast, I do want a disclaimer. Mm-hmm. Um, Dave and I are actually exes, right? <laughs> we dated. Yes. You were my very first official girlfriend in eighth grade. So I have um, kids now that are like way older than eighth grade. And the way I explain it is like when we were, you know, the age that we were, you weren't allowed to have a best friend that was a boy. So mm. we, got, we got around that, I feel like. Yeah. There was a way. Um, before we get even too far into this, I didn't uh, introduce you yet, Miss Liz Rose. Uh, but do you want to maybe give... Um, a little bit of an introduction to yourself, whatever that might look like? Sure. Uh, My name is Liz. I am a grateful believer in Jesus. Um, I started recovery about five years ago. Um, I think that my belief in God and my thoughts on religion have really been shaped in the last four or five years more so than my upbringing. Um, I left the church that I grew up in about four or five years ago. So I feel like I have a different perspective and hopefully it can help to reach people who maybe are looking for um, something a little different that hopefully makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple of things in there that I can relate to. Well, first of all, talking about recovery, um, I'd like to talk about that. I guess I'll leave it up to you because that's one area I'd like to touch on at some point. And I do want to talk, we were messaging about what you just talked about um, a couple weeks ago with regard to uh, the synod of churches that we grew up in. And so now you're saying you're in a different uh, organization. And uh, so I want to speak to that too. Is there anything else before we get to those that you uh, really want to get to yourself or that you feel would be beneficial for anyone else to talk about? Um, I feel like that covers it overall, but I think there's going to be some details that I'll probably be adding in from time to time. Okay. So why don't we, can we go like this? Can we kind of go through sort of, um, just walking through your life a little bit more slowly and kind of let, given a, a backstory as to how, cause you, you mentioned these things that are more recent and at the end of the road where you're at right now, but can you give a little bit of like, however you feel comfortable sharing um just sort of your story i guess sure um so within recovery i've given my testimony quite a few times so edit for length if you need (laughs) um so i was born in milwaukee um i had christian parents i was molested by a neighbor when i was four um I kept it a secret for a long time because I felt like um, I was guilty of it as well. Um, So I didn't really share that much until I got to be about 15 or so. When you say you you felt guilty of it as well, like you felt um, ashamed and so because of what happened and so you didn't feel like you could talk about it, is that what you mean? Yeah, I felt like it was just as much what I had done as much as what he had done, I guess, if that makes sense, which obviously, in light of recovery, in light of God's grace, like, that's not, I had nothing to do with that, if you know what I mean. That's what I wanted to clarify, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So I felt a lot of shame for it for a very long time. Um, I um, sank into a really deep and profound um, depression for a number of years, uh, including like my time in high school. So um, it was, high school for me was not a great time. Um, Aside from the severe depression, I was trying to be one way on the outside while also dealing with these demons on the inside. Don't let anyone know. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it wasn't so much about fitting in it was more about 
what can I do to have fun? Mm -hmm. So I did everything. Like, if you think of it, I probably did it, to be honest. <laughs> um, and so in the course of that, before things had got really off kilter, um, when you hold on, when you say did everything, so what what are you talking about there? So within the time frame of let's say fifteen to twenty one, um, all the drugs, all the promiscuous, all that in that bubble. Um, I drank a lot. Um, I would do things like drive drunk mm. because I was invincible. Um, so, I mean, not even like, it wasn't even like I smoked a little pot here and there more that like I binged on heroin and I did cocaine for a whole summer. And wow. so, it, yeah, <laughs> it was, it was quite a lot. It was, um, so, um, it didn't get my, my substance abuse and promiscuity and that kind of thing. It, it wasn't too terrible it wasn't it wasn't much more than what you would expect of a teenager until I was 17 okay. uh, I was at a party I met some guy at the party and I was brutally raped like I almost died oh this so I had therapy and treatment and um you know time off of school because I was physically, I was that broken from it. Um, months of therapy. Yeah. I felt like I was starting to come around except it, it was like, I, I didn't want to do anything for the first six months. And then I realized, well, I survived this so I can survive anything. <laughs> so that's when um, cocaine, heroin, like, mm really, you know, <laughs> really darker kind of stuff started happening. Gotcha. About how old were you when this happened? I was 17. Wow. Yeah. So about 15, very severe depression, 17, um, brutally raped, um, 19 then in the midst of all these, like, I mean, it, like it, it wasn't just really hard drugs it was stupid things like um maxing out my credit card on pizza you sure. know like, mm -hmm. it was very wild um in the midst of my wild year or whatever um i my mom called me at my friend's house i was actually going to do a normal thing that night um my mom made me come home because my 16 year old sister had died. Yeah. Um, so she was in a car accident. She died instantly. Um, before the paramedics got there, she was already deceased. Um, so that really, those big three uh, really kind of made me I didn't really know what I was looking for anymore in life. Um, after my sister died, I spent six months um, taking care of my parents, like grocery shopping, making sandwiches, vacuuming the living room. Like they were so devastated. They couldn't, they couldn't do it. Like they just couldn't. So I can't even imagine good for you for being there for them. I can't imagine how you were even there for them when you had to be just devastated yourself. Yeah, I mean, I certainly was, but I, I think having faced some forms of tragedy beforehand, mm -hmm. um, you know, like it's not all that tragic when your grandma dies, but understanding what that is and how that plays out. Um, and also just the, 
learning how to cope with all these other things that I had already done or had done to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I think at that point, it put me in a really great position to realize like, I can, I can get up and go. I might want to just lay down and die, but I honestly, I, I want to get up and go. I want to make some sandwiches and, you know, wash the tub and um, get the mail and sort it and that kind of thing. It's not, as a, like, I, I hadn't ever done that before. <laughs> I was 19. I never lived on my own. I never knew how to do all this stuff. But like yeah. now that we are grownups and I think of that kind of stuff as really mundane, um, kind of mindless, I guess. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it really helped me to work through my grief to feel like I'm accomplishing um, just these very obvious when you vacuum the floor, you can see that it's clean now. Right, it's it's an immediate change. That's one of the, I don't, have you heard of Jordan Peterson at all? So. Okay, he's, so. a, he's a psychologist um, who's uh, I follow and he talks about cleaning your room if you're depressed yeah. or if you're trying to get your, if you're trying to get your insides in order, sometimes it's best to start with just what's around you and clearing up the area and then that sort of does a, a number on you psychologically and gets you going that way too. So makes sense. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And you know, um, like my parents wouldn't eat if I didn't give them a sandwich. It didn't occur to them to do that. So even those mundane, like little things, seeing them pile up and seeing my parents almost start to smile when they see my sandwich, like that started to help me. Um, yeah. Well, I, I didn't feel normal, you know, but I felt more that I was doing something, that I was serving other people, which my whole life up till then, I never, I never served anyone, you know. That's interesting. Yeah. Do you feel, um, <clears throat> I'm asking this because I, I went, I can relate to the part where you talked about there was this thing from your childhood that when you got to high school, you were still kind of subconsciously feeling. Do, when do you think it was? Uh, do you think you had any idea at that time why you felt uneasy or did you put the pieces for that together later on in life? At first, I wasn't really... At first, I felt like I was feeling bad about myself because of something I had done. Mm, Not right. so much that this incident happened a long time ago, but more so the sense of, well, I didn't, I didn't even try on my math test, and that's why I feel bad. Oh. Um, yeah. But I actually, I saw this. At that time, MTV was starting to have more, I guess, societal type in-depth news or something instead of just like um, call in and listen to your favorite video, whatever. Mm -hmm. I actually saw an episode where uh, there was, I forget who it was, but it was probably three to five people that were older than me, but they all had said, you know, when I was little, I was molested and this is how I felt and this is what happened. And mm. it really like, a, I was blown away. I mean, I knew this had happened. I, I never forgot that mm -hmm. it had happened. Mm -hmm. um, but to hear people say it out loud on TV for anyone to see them say that was terrifying, but also emboldening for me, I think, because I was able to start to address um, the mental health issues that I was already starting to deal with, that I didn't put all the pieces together, but mm -hmm. actually recognized a need for me to have therapy and, um, you know, psychological drugs and things like that, like not, not just street drugs, and, right. you know, well, like, 
the doctor can prescribe this and it can actually work, that kind of thing. Right, right. Yeah, it's powerful what you said that you heard someone else talking about their story and that that was what prompted you to start feeling more comfortable talking about your story. Um, right. And I think that, uh, I hope that, that what's happening right now with you talking about your, your story and your experience that that will lead to that same effect for other people's lives. I think that's um, so important. And uh, so if I can cut in for just a minute here on this point is, um, I think I've been thinking a lot about this and, and, and knowing when it's okay to talk about things with other people um, because there are, there's the sentiment in God's word of trying to protect each other's pride. So it's not like we just go around gossiping about people, obviously, and that, that's incredibly important to build each other up. But at the same time, uh, what I've been feeling with an experience in my own life is that sometimes um, people's behavior is able is enabled by our silence. And um, that we are supposed to speak out uh, and try and help each other in other situations. So I think that, um, you know, I've, I've been talking a lot about the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve and how they wanted to hide themselves and cover themselves up as soon as they sinned. Because that's what Satan wants you to think is that if you uh, are fully known, then everybody will attack you and judge you for that. And unfortunately, um, he's been a able to do a good job of creating that foundational belief in our society to where you know social media is almost the most extreme version of here we're just going to put out the white picket fence and if anything doesn't match up with that facade that we want to have then we're just not going to talk about it and if someone else brings anything up out of the dirt then shame on you for talking about it i mean it's gotten to where it's like i was talking with my friend the other day about um, we say, hey, how's it going? But if someone actually starts to say how they're doing, it's almost considered rude. Like, <laughs> I didn't really want to get into it with you. I talked about that in the last episode too, is um, I think people are afraid to be sad, afraid to be vulnerable. I think many people think that if they're not happy, they need to quick run away and find happy right now and, and fill it with that instant gratification, kind of what you were talking about earlier. Right. Yeah. I, I firmly believe that sin thrives in the dark. Sin mm -hmm. dies in the light. Right. Like, there's no way around it. If you're able to make yourself known and able to confess to somebody, um, an accountability partner, if, if you're able to form that type of a vulnerable relationship with somebody, um, that person ends up being your person for the rest of your life. Right now I have uh, maybe like three or four people right now, if anything were to happen at all, um, I can call either of those ladies and they would be right there for me, helping me talk it out. Yeah. Like talk is so important for healing and talking within community is much more. I think talking within community is much more um, able to cleanse us than talking one-on-one. -on -one. I've had a lot of one-on-one -on -one therapy and I do believe that therapy works. And I think everyone should have therapy. I also think that um, if you can have frank conversations with fellow believers who are able to help hold you up, hold you accountable, um, uh, how does that go? A strand of three is not easily broken. Mm -hmm. If, if you and your good friend, if you invite God into it, that strand cannot be broken. Mm -hmm. Amen. I think uh, 
two, the other thing is, so like part of it is um, for recovery, especially. So like if I am fully open about my vulnerabilities or let's say I'm craving to use something and I'm, I'm really addicted to that something and I shouldn't be using it, but I, I am feeling that craving. If I don't talk about that craving and get it out into the light, then like you said, it will just fester in the darkness and become even bigger, something that is completely out of my control. And also uh, if I've done something wrong, and this, this doesn't have to be with drugs or alcohol or whatever, but anything, if I've done something wrong, if I don't talk about it, I can continue on with that behavior and never learn from it. But if I talk about it and I have to fess up to it and, and feel all that goes with uh, sharing a vulnerability, because it's not like it's exactly fun to say, hey, I messed up. Right. But if I do that and I put myself through that process, the pain of that process will make it so I don't want to do it as much. Whereas if I'm just keeping it in the darkness, I don't feel that pain ever. It's just something that I can keep feeding. Um, you know, they say there's always two wolves and whichever one you feed is the one that's going to be stronger. So that, that's the other part that I don't, you know, um, we, we stay, we don't want to talk about things because we're afraid that people will react negatively. And so that kind of, it creates this two-way street. So it's not just about me being good about being honest, but there's a responsibility as the listener to praise that and see it for what it is. And rather than just going face value and, and realizing there's something that you don't like hearing right now, uh, assessing the whole situation and, and, and seeing the beauty in someone, first of all, trusting you to give them to give you this secret that they're uneasy about. I mean, that's a, an honor really. Like you were saying, that person's now your, your confidant of sorts. And, um, right. and then just that trust goes both ways. If you ever um, want someone to feel comfortable talking to you, you need to make yourself approachable and, and um, empathetic and all that, so, yeah. And further, I think it's very important that um, whoever you're talking to has a really great understanding of grace. Um, so you both agree on what grace is and how it works and recognizing that you're going to fall down. But this other person, when you tell them that you've fallen down, uh, one of the first things they should say is, you know, you're, you're incredibly loved. I love you so much. And, you know, the creator of the universe who made all the stars, all the people on earth, he loves you very much too, mm -hmm. despite what you may have done. Or what's happened to you. Yeah, yeah, mm. that for sure, yeah. Mm. Um, so after your sister passed away and you were living with your parents then for a while, Yes. Um, how long did that go on for and, and what did life look like after that? Yeah. So continuing on, <laughs> I, um, so when my sister died, I was living with my parents. I had never moved out. Um, I was taking a gap year because I had, for a lack of a better way of explaining, basically I had, um, left high school, but came back to get a diploma, just kind of an alternate school situation thing, basically like just finish up. So um, I decided I was going to take a gap year and the gap year was just doing whatever I wanted to do until um, December 29th when uh, my sister died. And I, I mean, there's a lot of feelings that go along with that. Um, through the process of um, being available for my parents all the time, I started to recognize that I need to think about priorities in my own life. What do I want to do? What, where do I want to, you know, um, it, like the, 
the drugs and crazy living, like that was actually easy to walk away from at first because my friends all walked away from me. Mm. Um, I was profoundly sad and depressed and just very intensely grieving. And the people that I partied with didn't know what to do with that. So they just kind of, they all kind of left. So it was just me and my parents for a while. Um, my friend from high school came back to town and asked me if I would move into her dad's rental house that was vacant so that she and I could um, help clean up the rental house and get it ready for the next renters. Okay. So about six months after having taken care of my parents and starting to see like my dad is able to go to the store and beyond just going to the store, going to the store without having a panic attack, like we're moving, we're making progress. Um, I felt like I was ready to go. It was less than a mile from my house. So um, I, because we're renovating the house, we didn't have like, we weren't like all set up or anything. We had like sure. a camp stove and tents. And so I also had a second friend who lived nearby who had recently had a baby. So I would um, help my friend with these renovations, drywall and, <laughs> you know, all, all the, I mean, I'm, I learned a little bit about a lot of things, but if you ask me now, I wouldn't know, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that must've so, been fun though. What's that? That must've been fun though. It was, it was really fun. Um, we just listened to whatever music we wanted to loudly um, her dad would come and say, okay, so today, uh, you're going to strip the floor in this room. And we didn't know how to do that. And he'd show us and then leave and we'd, we'd strip the floor or, you know, hang the drywall in this room. And, you know, it wasn't, I, I wouldn't have made it a career. Like sure. even at that moment, it wasn't like a career. It was fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I would do that during the day. And then I had my friend who lived close by who just had a baby. So I would go to her house and hang out with her baby. And uh, <clears throat> one day I was at her house and um, this guy that I had known in high school showed up. And it was weird because I hadn't seen him in a couple of years. Um, we used to hang out in the same group of friends. We weren't like super close or anything. Mm -hmm. um, so his name was Mark and we started dating. Um, we were dating for about six weeks before he left for Germany for a year. So um, I went to Germany for about two months total. He came back. Um, when he came back, he asked me to marry him and I told him no. <laughs> Um, so this wasn't the time or so, uh, he, this is where his testimony and my testimony start to really interlap. Right. Yeah. So even before Germany, he had been hiding, um, a porn addiction. And I had told him from the get go, like the fact that I had experienced this terrible trauma that nobody should ever have to experience. I, I had PTSD. I have PTSD. Mm -hmm. I don't want anything like that anywhere near me. Um, mm -hmm. And if that's not okay with you, then we can part ways, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so he, I knew that he was still looking at porn. So I told him no. Um, and he asked me another time and I told him no again. And then in December, so like we're talking a year and a half of us having dated to begin with one year of his absence in December of that year, I found out I was pregnant mm. and said, okay, so now will you marry me? <laughs> so, um, the culture that I grew up in was very much so 
if you get pregnant, you're getting married. Um, so I, I got married. Um, in the first six months or so, um, I found out that he had been, you know, um, and I'm going to, sorry. <laughs> in the first six months or so, I found out that he was still active in his porn addiction. And I told him, we can have marriage counseling or I'll leave right now. So we went to marriage counseling at the church that we were going to at the time, which was a part of the church that we had grown up in. And um, the marriage counselor said that porn addiction isn't real. You just need to stop. And you, young lady, stop nagging him. Um, so that was our, that was the marriage counseling we received at that time. So um, I had a baby. I had another baby right away. Um, and he knew when we, when he first asked me to get married, he knew my stance. When we did the marriage counseling, he knew my stance. Um, so, uh, I had two beautiful babies. I stayed home with them. He worked, he traveled a lot for work. Um, I was very much involved with my two girls. Um, anything that they did, I was there with them. Um, for lack of a better reason, because he just wasn't. So I was always the, the present parent. Um, and so then about five years ago, um, it came to light that he was still very much involved in his pornography addiction um, and that he had been lying to me. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't even a lie of omission where I just assumed and he just assumed it was that I would ask him repeatedly and repeatedly he would say, no, of course not. No, I could never. Um, so that's when we started recovery. Um, for me, going to this recovery meeting that a friend from our church recommended, mm -hmm. this recovery meeting was outside of our church. Our friend recommended it, and it was a box to check on the way to divorce. Mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the day, I can say, I did this, I did this, I did this, I did this. My hands are clean. <laughs> hmm. So that's how it started. What gave you that impression? Why do you say that? What do you mean? Do you think that that's your impression of it? Or, so you said this group, this group or this class was basically just like, that's, uh, it's over if you're going through that. Can you talk a little bit more about that or? Oh yeah. So the recovery group that we joined? That's what, okay. It was a recovery group, but you said it was like checking boxes off before divorce. My, my own view of my going to these meetings was that I was checking the box. Gotcha. Okay. Got it. The, the program itself is profoundly helpful. Okay. Um, I, through recovery is where I found a new life in Jesus. Like without uh, celebrate recovery, I would be where I had been my whole life. Um, it completely changed my view on um, God, the world, other people. Um, I think one thing that, we don't talk about as people is, and I know I've said this before, but grace. Mm -hmm. Grace is a huge, um, if I didn't have grace, if I wasn't shown grace, I, I, I'd, you know, I, I'd still be where I was when I was 18 or 17 or whatever. Um, so just, 
having a right understanding of what God's grace is and a right understanding of why our testimony is so important for building up the kingdom here on earth and the fact that the kingdom is here right now. Um, the, the kingdom of God isn't some far off abstract idea that maybe we'll get to someday. The kingdom of God is right here, right now with us. And it's, uh, it's quite a jump from where we grew up, but, um, I, I see it everywhere in the Bible that the kingdom of God is actually right here with us. And I, think it, I, I think I know what you mean, but keep going. All right. Coming into the realization of how badly that you need Christ, recognizing how badly that you need him, recognizing your need for a community of people to be accountable to and for them to be accountable to you and recognizing that the grace is here. You just have to reach out and grab it. Um, none of these being these abstract far away, someday maybe we'll understand the mystery. It's like, there's no mystery. Um, the, Holy, the Holy Spirit awakened me. Um, he's just as real as you and me. He's here right now with us. And, you know, like I say, for some people that might be kind of a crazy way of thinking, but I, I do believe I, I read the Bible every day. Um, and I find it over and over in the Bible that the Holy Spirit is here with us. It's plain as day. He's not a mystery that we can't understand. It, it's God's grace that's compelling us to do these good things for other people. It's God's grace compelling us to share our testimony so that other people can come into the kingdom as well. There's no reason to wait on the other side and hope that someday it'll be here. Just step into it. It's right here. Yeah, I, I definitely see, you know, there's heaven and there's hell in the afterlife. Right. But it's like, um, you know, I used to think, of God's law, like the Ten Commandments, as um, like rules, arbitrary rules that they would make God happy if you follow them. But as I've gotten older, it's it's more like this is the way it is. Like this is just the way it is. If you do these things, you're going to find joy, and you're going to be living your life according to my will, and that will bless you. If you right. don't, then the way it is, is you're going to see every version of hell and death that you want to see. <laughs> I mean, like, so, yeah, it can bring real life benefit to us right now. Um, so it's, it's symbolic of the afterlife, but it's also real. It's both. That's something that I've been, so like with, uh, even in the <clears throat> uh, Garden of Eden and they're cast out of that perfection and they can't get back in. To me, that's another one of those. It's like, that's symbolic of them being cast out of heaven essentially, but it's, it, was, it also really happened, I believe, that they were literally kicked out of that garden. Um, and it's weird because the more I've been studying God's word lately, I've seen a lot of those types of both objective and subjective meanings to things it's really profound uh and kind of mind-blowing but at the same time it 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 doesn't there can't be any other way so i think that's like the thing that's been blowing my mind so much is with god uh i believe he has a grand design and is uh working out his plan of salvation in all of his created people uh and I believe that how God is doing it and the way that it is, that there is no other way that this is not just like the best way, but the only way. Right. And, 
uh, that's brought peace, but it's also, there's so much mystery there. Um, real quick to that point, and I'm hoping that this is a good way to segue into one of the other things that we were going to talk about was, um, we were both raised Lutheran. Mm -hmm. um, and we were both raised in a specific synod of Lutheranism in, the, in Wisconsin. And I was just talking to a friend the other day because I'm going through a situation where I've, I've left the church that we grew up in. And it's been the hardest decision of my life. Um, last year started with me trying to draw people to this church. And it ended with me feeling like I had to leave. And it was my choice to leave. I wasn't like kicked out, but I, I felt like I didn't have a choice if I was trying to follow God's will. And that's a hard, hard thing to say. And so I was thinking a lot about that. And I was thinking about, uh, cause I was looking at like the reformation and all of this stuff, you know, there was the, the church coming up uh, out of when Jesus lived and, and the new Christian church that was growing and building um, the Catholic church and then there came a point during the Reformation where there was a split. And I completely agree with what Martin Luther, he made a public statement against his church and put all the things that he saw as wrong right out there for everybody to see. And we, pray, we praise him for that. Uh, it's good to bring that corruption to the light. And... Uh, but something that's interesting from there is, so that's like the start of the Protestant movement and uh, people started calling themselves Lutherans. And I was thinking about that because growing up at this church and at the school that we went to, I was never, I always felt this uneasiness with calling myself a Lutheran. I remember even very young having the thought, I believe in Jesus. Why am I calling myself after some dude that just, you know, you know, lived uh, during the Reformation. Um, it's almost cultish in a way to, to if someone started calling themselves fin, Finians or whatever, like, I'd be like, no, stop that. <laughs> Don't do that. I'm not that guy. And Luther had a problem with people calling themselves Lutherans, even, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So the reason I bring that up is... <clears throat> um, now it's not just Catholics and Lutherans. There's like every which, there's all these ways of people saying they're not affiliated with someone else. And it yeah. seems like that just like ramped up to a billion during that time. And now you've got every, so many different versions of the church. And each one is very, very careful to say, we do not associate with that church they believe in jesus but they got things that we don't like and so there's a part of that i think that that is it's god pleasing to want to keep things pure with regard to the word uh, and i was thinking about like with the time of noah it must have gotten to a point where their family he, he didn't feel comfortable going to church anywhere or that there just wasn't even any churches left and so noah and his family are just worshiping at home i guess or or whatever and, and and so there's kind of like two sides it's like i don't think we should be um this mentality of judgment i guess is what i'm getting at is and differentiation rather than community and looking for the similarities and how we can build each other up and grow and learn in the word it seems more like uh, no, we're just, we're members of this club and you can't be in because you're a member of that club. And it seems like it's where I ultimately had a problem with it was the evangelism is so constrained. I don't even know who I'd be reaching out to necessarily anymore. And now that I've left that church, I feel like I need to be preaching to a lot of people there. But I'm careful to say that because... I have family from that church and I know I have many friends as well. Right. Who I think are thinking the right way. But it's like when you've grown up in the system, it's hard to see through it, you know? Right. So that's a lot of rambling for, <laughs> I don't know what to say. It's like this mindset of division and judgment. Right. Uh, to the point where I've, I could relate 
last year, um, I had I wanted to meet people where they were at, and Jesus had the same thing. Yes. But when he did that, the Pharisees detested it. Right. And I have felt that exact same Pharisee like, what are you doing with them, or what are you doing saying it like that for those? Uh, and it's so clearly wrong. So. Yeah. It's a hard place to be. It seems inevitable that uh, it has to keep kind of breaking down like that. But the end times talk about, you know, a, a globalization of the uh, economy and I think of the church as well. And so it could just all be birthing pains to the end. I don't know. But Well, the place <laughs> that you find yourself in right now is super hard. But it's also super exciting. Um, my experience with churches outside of the synod, more times than not, they're happy to get together with other churches in order to provide service. So what I do right now, I, I live in Fort Worth. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I deliver groceries to seniors. I uh, help out at food banks. I help distribute socks to homeless people. Um, that's done through a church, but it's also done through like four other churches. So one church that may be Baptist says, hey, we're going to, um, we'll collect the socks this month. And the Pentecostal church over here says, hey, uh, we want to make a big meal for the people on Lancaster. That's the street where we have a lot of homeless people. We want to make a big meal. So great. Well, you know, volunteers from all the churches come together. It's, it's really a beautiful thing. Um, there's a food pantry that I serve at once a month that includes people from all sorts of different churches. And it's, it's known that it's like a, church-based food pantry if you don't find yourself going to church come anyway we're not mm -hmm. gonna like judge you for it whether you go you don't go whether you believe you don't believe but the the reputation is that it's these churches coming together to provide food for people who need it um i i think when it comes to practical needs for people in the world regardless of their um, circumstance or um, what they look like or what they smell like, when churches can come together, it's such a beautiful thing. Um, and the person being served feels blessed, but the reason that I do these things isn't, the, the reason that I do this is because it's such a blessing to me to be able to bless other people yeah. with practical needs that I know that I'm able to help them meet. Yeah. Um, and so my life now, I've, I've lived here for two and a half years. So my life now, right now, um, revolves around, I'll send an email to the outreach director at this church saying, hey, we need volunteers. Uh, next Saturday for this coat drive mm -hmm. um, or I'll find out my friend will say hey you know I was gonna go um, pick up these canned goods for this other distribution at a separate church somewhere else you want to come mm -hmm. um, so that's that's the kind of thing that I do now all the time with other it, it's such a beautiful thing to see other Christians uh, regardless of where they are in their walk um, to all be able to come together. Um, the food pantry that I was talking about where we all come together, we pray beforehand, all of us. And it's amazing. Like um, the volunteers, the participants, we all pray together. And it's such an amazing thing to see these people who they don't look anything alike. They don't, a lot of them don't even speak the same language. And it's just such a beautiful thing to see um, different churches might have different 
ideas on certain things. Um, but my experience has been that some issues are open handed and some issues are closed handed. So I wouldn't associate with somebody. I mean, I still associate with anyone. I don't care who you are. <laughs> I'm here. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't make a practice of having an accountability partner, let's say, who um, doesn't believe in the afterlife. Like to me, that's a closed handed issue. Mm. I won't I won't form a very deep bond with somebody who doesn't believe something that I do. Because it's such a core teaching for you. It's like, no, it's a deal breaker. Yeah, I see what you're saying. But there's plenty of things. Um, is it okay to serve wine or is it only juice? If you only serve juice, is that okay for communion? Right. Um, is it okay if when you pray, you don't hold your hands? Are tattoos good? Are tattoos bad? There's right. plenty of open-handed issues that I welcome. I mean, I don't, you know, I'm at this point, I'm pretty laid back, honestly, after, <laughs> after the recovery that I've experienced, I'm feeling like I've, I've done worse. So yeah, come on. Right. I'm hanging. <laughs> well, and so I want to, <clears throat> you have sparked a couple of thoughts in me as you were talking through that. It's like, I, um, what I've always appreciated about the church that we grew up in is that they take very seriously um, trying to not water down God's word uh, right. and to keep the truth of God's word pure. And um, I, I truly have a great appreciation for that because I think um, there can be the temptation for some churches to, to do that, to water down the message, to try and appeal to a larger uh, population and even if they think that their motivations for doing something like that are okay it's never okay to change the word of god uh absolutely yeah it's it's, it's perfect in every way if it's um if it seems abrasive to someone it's supposed to seem that way to them you know what i mean it's it's not uh we aren't supposed to change that so i i appreciate that and i think so much of the mentality perhaps comes from that um, good place, but the, so that's why I've been thinking a lot about like this needing to differentiate from other churches or, or where exactly it's coming from the, I went, um, I just inadvertently found myself digging into hell last year and I had no prior intention of doing that, but it came up because of some, some things that had come up at the church. I'd heard the pastor say that from the pulpit that Judas is burning in the fires of hell. And I didn't know what about that made me feel uncomfortable at the time, but it didn't feel right. So I looked more into it. And I personally believe it's at least open for interpretation there. And um, so initially this pastor said he agreed with that. And then after the fact said, no, he knows that Judas is burning in hell. I thought, wow, okay, well, that makes me uncomfortable. Um, and then there was a section in First Peter where it's talking about spirits in prison um, when Jesus descended into hell. And the commentary on that section from uh, this synod uh, was really bizarre to me. It seemed to just kind of straight up uh, misinterpret, misinterpret the original Greek and Hebrew, or at least they gave like three options for what they thought the interpretation was. They said uh, bizarre, less bizarre, and most likely. And the one that they said was most likely to me didn't match up at all. And the one that had the actual original Greek and Hebrew that to me seems like it's not even open for interpretation. They were saying that that was the most bizarre one. So that was another one. When I was trying to start the podcast, this, <laughs> um, Originally, I had reached out to a couple pastors from that synod because I wanted to, and this is exactly how I said it, start out with like a baseline of truth as I'm talking to different uh, religions, hopefully. And not only did the one turn me down, he said that he knows his grandma is in hell and millions of other people. 
I was like, how can you say something like that? How, who are you to say that? Um, right. It's one thing to say it didn't look good for somebody, but to say, you know, so that was really scary to me. And then that pastor said, I'm not going to do your podcast. I think this is false prophet kind of stuff. And then he went, I had told him another pastor that I was going to reach out to. He called him up and said, don't do this. <laughs> so that's where I'm like, not only, so I'm trying to be the hands and feet of Christ here and reach out and, and meet people where they're at and have conversations about my own faith too. Right. And he, not only are you not helping, but you're actively working against me. Uh, and then there was more stuff that came after that, after I told my story. And, and enough of that stuff piles up and it becomes a pattern of this division and judgment. We're multiple pastors now are telling me they know people's eternal fate uh, when God's word says clearly don't go there. Um, so I don't, I don't like that those things came up uh, at all, but they did. And so it's like, what do I do with that information? I'm not comfortable with it. <laughs> so now I've found myself, this podcast has become more like me trying to see if I can find a church. <laughs> I mean, that's where I'm at now is I don't even know if I can trust myself. Um, I'm trying to work through that in, in getting back in with another family. But right now it feels like if I would get close to anywhere, I'm just setting myself up to get hurt. And it's funny because when I first started down that path, I was speaking in those terms uh, for other people feeling that way of like, how do we reach those people who might have had an experience that just turned them off to the church and now i am that person it's a weird how the last year has gone so um my feet are still on the rock <clears throat> but um it's like i don't necessarily see membership in the global church of christ uh, that that membership in this specific church is any indication of that right yeah i agree with that i think um I, I won't regularly attend a church that regularly waters down the gospel to make it sound like what you want to hear. Mm -hmm. If my friend asks me to go to this church, I really like it, but I don't know what I think, but do you want to come along? I'll go to the church and then I'll tell my friend very openly what I think about it. Um, the, the idea of knowing ahead somebody's fate, isn't that kind of, pharisaical isn't that something that the pharisees would do in jesus time like prejudge predestiny that kind of thing that doesn't seem biblical you know I, don't, I don't know how it gets to the point where you say you know your own family that where they are yeah yeah, yeah. and that i think that really um when my sister died i had no reason to believe that she wasn't in heaven like she was a strong believer mm -hmm. she was 16 but she definitely believed in god um and that really that set me out on this kind of journey um you know over a decade long of so am i going to heaven um what about you know these other people if if someone commits suicide can they go to heaven i started really questioning um some of the theology regarding that idea and just digging into the Bible more to see what, what does the Bible say about this? Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think hell is real. I think that hell is the eternal absence of God. Um, and what that looks like, practically speaking, I have no idea. Um, my husband and I were actually talking about this because I was telling him that uh, I was going to be on your podcast. And um, his thought was, what if um, hell is separation from God, but what if we don't know for how long? What if there's such a thing of being in hell and then not being in hell? Like, it was kind of this weird philosophical, it, it really took a lot of turns, but all that to say, sometimes, 
sometimes in dealing with a church that is completely rock solid, will never change on their theology, looking at that church, I wonder how much the church itself is just putting God in a box. This idea of like, hell is here, but it's not, that's crazy, right? But isn't that possible? If God created and is still sustaining everything, is that possible? Is what possible? Specifically? Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe hell is, or maybe hell isn't. Like, either of those two could very well be possible. There's no, I feel like, I feel like sometimes people stand on their rock um, without recognizing that there are possibilities in life that we've never thought of. Even, even our little earthly life, we've never thought of these possibilities. What about eternal life? Hell is a, um, well, I told you, I've been really digging into hell over the last year. Uh, right. What, um, and when you were talking about grace earlier, well, I know a lot of people were uncomfortable with how deeply I was studying hell, as if to think that I was like, um, becoming a Satan worshiper or, or something. I don't know. I just, I can see how it would make someone uncomfortable if, if like if one of my kids was suddenly, I want to know everything there is no about hell. Um, but what I found is the more that I dug into hell and looking for people who were listed as being there in the Bible, the more I found God's grace. And what I mean by that is like, it seems like there's, there's two sets of eyes that you can look at God's word with. One that's looking for all the places where he could have sent someone to hell. Or if you look, what the words are actually saying and are super uh, faithful to that, uh, what I found is there's a lot of loopholes, not loopholes, but opportunities where God saved all those people. The flood is one of the, the coolest ones that I thought of is, um, I, I really don't think it's outside of the realm of possibility for God to have saved everyone in the flood. Yeah. Uh, that everybody who saw what he said he was going to do, and then it actually happened, then they're like, oh, crap, yep, God's right, you know? And I think that that's how a lot of people will come to faith, is having uh, experienced the weight of the law. Because um, that was not a gospel message. It wasn't like, hey, I'm going to save you now. It was like, nope, you're, it's over. Um, but I think God uses even death to save people. Um, but so I want to, I want to clarify one thing that I talked about in my story about hell as I studied it. And, uh, I've become more and more convinced of this as I've, since I've talked about it in my story. So, you know, I mentioned how in the beginning it says that God created the heavens and the earth. There's no mention of hell being created. We find out later in God's word that hell does exist and that anyone who doesn't want to be in God's presence forever, can choose to go to hell instead. Um, many people have thought that God must have like created hell, picked up his creation stick again, after he said he was done with it, uh, after the, the fall or somewhere in there that he must have done it then. But you're adding to God's word, plus it doesn't make any sense because he sat down his creating. He was done creating the seventh day. Right. So to me, there's no more making anything after he's rested from that. If, it, if he made it, then it had to have happened in the six days of creation. But God right. doesn't say that. What's interesting is in Revelation or in Genesis 3, verse 6, the fall into sin, after they've sinned, God says, cursed is the ground now. And he says to Satan, the serpent, cursed are you to the ground, which is kind of an interesting thing to say to a snake. Right. Who's already crawling on the ground. I've heard other theories that maybe they thought that he was a lizard originally and that now he didn't have any arms or legs. Um, but what it could be saying there, I think, is that God in that moment, when we separated ourselves from God with our sin, and it would make sense, God never intended for anyone to go to hell. Uh, it says that the angels and demons will go to the place that was prepared for them. But God didn't like prepare 
for people to go to hell. He didn't want that. He prepared, he prepared this earth for us and the angels. Uh, then we separated ourselves with sin. And so I started asking, could we have created hell? And is this like the first iteration of hell? And what I mean by that is like true hell is like you said, the absence of God forever. That's the definition of hell to me is the absence of God and his order and his love forever. Right now, it's not forever because there's a way out through Christ. And also, even though we don't feel God's direct presence, he's, he's still orchestrating everything and okay. um, still keeping order for us. So, um, you know, the more I've been thinking about that, uh, Jesus descended into hell for three days. He was dead. I think that's symbolic of the 33 years that he lived on this earth. And if he hadn't risen back to life and he just stayed dead, that was the one that God said, he's your way out. So if we killed God and that's our way out, then we're stuck here. Where are we stuck? Hell, forever. Because Jesus, our savior, is no, he's now dead. Uh, also in Revelation, it says that that beast, uh, Satan will be hurled to the earth. Well, so I think, you know, it, it, before the fall, or like right when it happens, it says God is walking in the cool of the day, kind of implying like an actual guy. Then they're kicked out of heaven on earth, and you can't see God anywhere, except for when Jesus came. So it all seems to kind of point to, okay, we're living every man for himself right now, free will, run rampant, everybody's just doing whatever they want to do. We have the word and promises, uh, that we are putting all of our hope and faith in that he's going to come back and take us to heaven where he is right now. But so the really cool thing about this that I've been thinking about is in Revelation, it talks about the 24 elders and the 144,000 sealed, um, which uh, <laughs> I have to share this with you too. Sorry, I'm talking a lot now, but do you have your phone by you? I'm using my phone. Yeah. Oh, using, okay. So, um, in every day, there's 24 hours, right? Mm -hmm. 24 hours in every single one of our day, you could think. Now, if you take 24, 24 hours times 60, because there's 60 minutes in each hour, 24 times 60, you get 1440, 144, 1440. So there's the 144,000 sealed and the 24 elders in each and every one of our days. I think that's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, but so I think God says he wants all men to be saved, come to a knowledge of the truth. I, I think it puts God in a box, like you said, to say that he can't save someone. It comes down to free will, and only God has the, the scales for that. Uh, but so I've had this theory that got me into a lot of trouble that I think God could be making a way for all of his children, that he wants his whole body in heaven. And the cool thing about that though, I don't know that that will happen. I'm not the one to judge. I hope it happens. I believe that if anyone could make it happen, it'd be Yahweh, our awesome creator. Right. The cool part is that with what we were just talking about with hell is technically we all start out in hell. We all share that. We're all wretched sinners, completely trapped and screwed. Yeah. Unless we had Jesus. So that makes it an equal playing field for everyone. We're all starting out in the tribulation. And I think we're all going to end up on the mirror side of it in heaven. I could be very wrong about all of this, but right now today with studying God's word, that's, that's what I feel to be true. It's shocking. It's like, it's amazing to me how shocking it is to say that you think God can save everyone. Yeah. I mean, why wouldn't he? He's good. <laughs> you know, like all, just, the thing that I think about when it comes to God, 
when your son had his first goal at soccer, right? And you're at the game and you lean over to whoever's there and you're like, hey, that's my son. Every single day, our awesome and amazing father who created everything, the stars, water, seven billion other people that are here right now, every single minute of every single day, that good father is saying, hey, look at, look at David. Look at how he folded his laundry. <laughs> look at how, look at how great he is at drinking water. He's, he's drank all the water he needs today. Look, look at David, the way he writes that note. No, oh, that's my son. You know, like that's, that's the thing that I think God sees us as all the time because of his amazing grace. Well, it's like, um, I was just talking to my friend the other day too about, about the fall into sin. So when Adam and Eve, they sin and then they go run and hide behind like a bush or whatever. And God says, where were you? And when I was a kid, I used to think of that as God being like, where were you? like really angry, like a Batman voice kind of, you know, like, uh, but I don't think it was, I don't think of it that way now. I think of it more like almost kind of like playful, silly in a way, like a father and his child playing hide and seek, like, where were you? Like, yeah, you know that I know. And then Adam, when he comes out from behind there, I don't, he's like, ah, I was afraid because I sinned, so I hid. But I imagine even they were like, hiding for a second and like, what am I doing? You know? Uh, and then even when they, when God says they're going to die, I don't think it was like, I'm going, it's not like I'm going to, I'm going to kill you. He's just, you're going to die now because that's what happens. Right. So this is all, I believe this is all to teach us how to use free will because what little baby is going to automatically know how to use free will perfectly. Right. So God gave us this space and if he made a way out for it, the ones who created the original sin, everything's gotten so much muddier since then because we're all trying to like just make the most of this horrible, dark, sinful place. So if he made a way out for them, how much more is he fighting for the one and leaving the 99 like he says he's going to? Yeah, I feel like for me that... that sums up my life is I was the one lost sheep. I was the prodigal son. I was the one who threw it all away. These things, there were terrible things that happened to me. Don't get me wrong. It, I had no responsibility for those things that happened. But in response to these things that happened, I just threw it all away. Mm. Um, when I, even when I started recovery, I had, you know, a whole, I had divorce papers out ready to sign. I had uh, plans for what I'm going to do with my husband's money after we divorce. Um, I had all these things lined up for my own self. Um, and even like when, when my sister died, that was terribly tragic. And um, it, it was good taking care of my parents. It was good living with my friend. Uh, when my husband left for Germany, I moved back into my parents' house, but I went right back to cocaine and heroin and mushrooms. And it, it, was, it was like, it was like a, a reprieve. I had a reprieve and went back to the awful things. Um, and I think for a long time after that, I didn't really have a sense of shame over it because it was like, well, I did whatever, what are you going to do? Mm. Um, so I feel like in a way I, I stayed out there. I, I didn't understand that God wants an actual personal relationship. God, God wants to be here with me. He's not out there somewhere in the distance, just angry at me. Um, and I, it took me a long time to work that out, that um, God actually does really love me and has a lot of grace for me. Um, and once I, once I started to realize that is when I think my thinking started to turn around and realize that 
I was that dumb little sheep <laughs> all, all the way over here, you know. It's so hard to understand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it's hard to understand God's grace because he's the only one that can supply that, that type, that endless, unconditional, bottomless grace. Like, how can you even put it in words, you know? Mm -hmm. But what we were talking about before, and this is, I think, an important point to go along with the grace part, is um, grace is really great, uh, but sin is really bad. And uh, so, you know, I'm thankful for hell. The reason I say that is because uh, I used to get panic attacks about eternity when I was little because I would think about this evil world lasting forever. And that's, it is terrifying. If I had to keep going through all of this pain and everything that we go through in this life forever, it's like, no, thanks. Uh, don't sign me up for that. I don't want anything to do with that. Uh, and so I think it's like God could have designed things to where differently, like maybe if he stayed around and then there was this grace as he's right here with us. I almost feel like part of me thinks like maybe God knew we had to do it this way, get it boom, done, out out of the way, learn your lesson so that we can have the good stuff. <laughs> and this life is so short compared to forever. Um, but yeah, I want there to be a time when that door is shut and that order comes back in and you know, it's kind of scary because we'll always have that free will. And it's sometimes it's been hard for me to think like, why will we suddenly be better in heaven? But I, I truly think it's, it's from experiencing the pain of this life. So the law and then the grace of Jesus waking us up on that morning when we think it's done and saying, here, take your inheritance. I'm proud of you. Yeah. Take your crown and your new name. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we're getting, uh, close to time here, but the, I, there was a couple points that, um, so first of all, I want to say I had no idea about like any of this with you. I knew about your sister. I had no idea that you struggled with addictions. And so thank you so much for sharing that. You have been incredibly brave and open and honest and, uh, a really good example for other people, um, and so the couple points, specifically the molestation, um, is there anything that you can speak to for anyone else who's trying to heal from something like that, that was the greatest good to you or that opened up that door for healing for you the most? Like what helped you the most get through that? Or maybe you're still getting through it, but anything you can speak to someone else that might be there. I think um, if you've dealt with molestation where you were the victim, um, the thing that doesn't make any sense at all, but is the absolute truth, is that God doesn't see you as that person. Um, God sees everything that has happened and will happen. Um, God, God doesn't see you as dirty. God doesn't see you as unclean. Um, God doesn't see you as something that he's ashamed of. God was never ashamed of you to begin with. Um, you, you didn't disappoint him. You, it's impossible to disappoint God. He doesn't need your he doesn't need to be concerned whether you would disappoint him or not. Um, God is a, an amazing, great father who's just waiting for you to run in, cry out to him, literally cry out to him. Um, if you have an opportunity, get somewhere where you're alone, scream and cry out to God. He actually, he wants that. He doesn't want your relationship with him to be from here I am in this pew and God is out here somewhere. He wants to be close and personal to you. God wants you to uh, cry out to him, ask him questions. You're not going to hurt God's feelings. 
Um, you, That's an important one. Yeah. It's impossible for you to hurt God's feelings. And God is certainly not disappointed in what happened to you or maybe what your reaction to that might have been later. A lot of times these things carry on in our life and start a cycle of shoplifting or something like that. And the fact of the matter is the creator of the universe says you're enough. What are some of the, um, what are some things that you do to positively cope now, as opposed to how you used to cope back when you were, you know, just using cocaine or other drugs? Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the thing that gives me the most joy is helping other people. Um, I love to do all my volunteer things. I love to, um, minister to people who might need it. I love to, uh, be an accountability partner or, um, like a, a helper to the people going through whatever it is they're going through. Like God isn't afraid of what you've gone through, but me too. Like I'm, I'm not personally me. I'm not afraid of whatever it is you've done. Like, I want to hear it. I want to help you heal. Um, so being involved in a community where, um, our goal is to help people with their needs on earth and their emotional needs, their spiritual needs. Um, but beyond that, like in a lighthearted way, I have two labs. Um, one is a total derp and the <laughs> other is kind of passive aggressive. So it's kind of a weird dynamic. They're a lot of fun. Um, I have plants. I love my plants. I cook a lot. I, I love cooking. I used to, um, for about five years, I owned a very successful business. Um, and I closed the business down for a lot of different reasons and discovered that as much as I really enjoyed the business and serving people through the business, I realized I just really enjoy serving people with food too. Um, so I'll cook for, you know, depending on the situation, I'll have 10 people over and cook a big, a big meal. I love doing that. Um, for me, the key really is just to have community, to seek out and to find community. Mm -hmm. Amen to that. Another definition of hell would be being alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, sin really likes to keep you alone in many, many different ways. I know addictions uh, or any battles that we might be fighting, like we were talking earlier about how it can be scary to make yourself vulnerable and fully known. And because uh, the <clears throat> what your brain tells you is that you can do this, you can get it all swept up and you can get it back on track and you should wait till you got it all put back together before you tell them because otherwise they're going to be mad at you. Um, that's absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. You do not have to have it all put together. And if you're facing addictions, you won't have it all put together. Uh, so you need, you just have to take the brave step of saying, I know this is broken. I know this doesn't look great, but this is it. This is where I'm at. And I'm saying this to try and get better uh, and just to take that leap. Um, now, it's important to find people that you can trust. Um, but yeah, I just, I, you know, I struggled with that in my own life early on was feeling like, with a couple of my relationships, feeling like if I didn't have it all put together, that I couldn't talk about it. And I just want to shatter all that. And, uh, you know, here's us. Here's two people who don't claim to have it all put together all the time. And, um, but uh, it's about progress, not perfection. And just trying to be a better version of yourself than you were the day before. And that's the other danger with social media is we like to compare ourselves to others and think if we're not having that life, then we're a failure. And that's, that's so bogus too. Everybody's going through different struggles at different times whether they're super affluent or super poor or um what you know whatever the situation might be so yeah and it's also really important to remember that god works in the messiness mm -hmm. god is closer to you in the messiness sometimes than he ever was before and especially if you have like a 
a Christ following accountability partner who can remind you of that, it can change your whole trajectory of life. Um, I've seen before where, um, you know, the same kind of pattern, like, oh, if it's, if I'm not perfect and showing people I'm perfect, I'm a failure. Um, I've, I've seen the joy that comes in realizing that God wants you when you're messy and your, your friends, your Christ following accountability partners, they, they welcome you when you're messy. Mm -hmm. Um, anytime, any day, whatever. Like, I think that's something that we really ought to drive home to people to make sure that they are aware. Like you're, you're not broken to the point of not being fixed. You're not. Well, well, and the truth is, and so this is, this would be a good place to maybe kind of end it, I think. But the thing that I've realized a lot lately is, and this is, comes from God's word. It says that great wisdom comes from great suffering. Mm-hmm. Um, suffering produces perseverance and perseverance produces character and character hope. And um, so that's, it's actually, to me, that's a, you're receiving a reward in your suffering. There are lessons that you can take from that. And if you tie that in kind of like we were talking about, there's always like the symbolic, but then the bigger picture like objective is this whole life is suffering right to bring about understanding to bring about wisdom that i don't think we could have trusted god and just um not ever sinned right from the beginning like adam and eve they could have just trusted him not done what they did but they did and now we all have these new experiences of sin and suffering and um like we were saying earlier, so many times people think that that's something to run away from. And in the counseling world, more and more, we talk about trying to glean whatever lessons you can from sufferings. Um, uh, There's a great poem called uh, The Guest House. I don't know if you ever heard of that. It's a roomy poem, but it basically, it, it refers to this being human as a guest house each morning, a new arrival a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary um, consciousness comes and, uh, but just greet and entertain them all because each has been sent as a guide to teach you. And so I think that um, in the times where you're not feeling like a five out of five and you're feeling more like a one out of five, just have some peace and knowing that there's a lesson to be learned there that can make it so if you learn that lesson well you'll have more of the five out of fives if that makes any sense yeah so well and also if in the one out of five if you take that experience and share with others um the more testimony that you can share with other people the more other people can understand like hey i'm not i'm actually not i'm not terrible i'm not like irredeemable right um I think that's really important. The testimony of the saints is really important in um, spreading the kingdom of God. Amen. Well, thank you for your time tonight. Do you have anything else you want to talk about? Um, I think we covered it. Um, also, if you if you ever want, we can do this again. I'd be happy. Right. Yeah, if you think of something, let me know. Otherwise, it'd be good to update a couple months or whatever. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks so much for reaching out. Take care. Glad we got the tech issues resolved. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. All good. All right. Bye. Bye.